Of All Things by Robert C. Benchley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Turning Over a New Ledger Leaf. New Year's morning, approximately 92 million people in these United States will make another stab at keeping personal and household accounts for the coming year. One month from New Year's, there will be approximately 73 of these accountants still in the race. All started. Of these, 60 will be groggy but still game and willing to lump the difference between the actual balance in their pockets and the theoretical balance in the books under elastic heading general expenses or incidentals and start again for february the remaining thirteen who came out even will be either professors of accounting in business schools or out and out unreliable this high mortality rate among amateur accountants is one of the big problems of modern household efficiency and is exceeded in magnitude only by the number of schemes devised to simplify household accounting. Every domestic magazine, in the midst of its autobiographical accounts of unhappy marriages, must needs run a chart showing how far a family with an income of $1,500 a year can go without getting caught and still put something aside for a canary. Every insurance company has had prepared by experts a table of figures explaining how, by lumping everything except rent and incidentals under luxuries and doing without them, you can save enough from the wreckage of $1,200 a year to get in on their special 40-year adjournment policy. Those publications which cannot get an expert to figure out how much you ought to spend per day will publish letters from young housewives showing how they made out a budget, which in the end brought them in more money than they earned, and had the grocer and electric light company owing them money. The trouble with all these vicarious budgets is that they presuppose on the part of the user an ability to add and subtract. They take it for granted that you are going to do the right thing. Now, with all due respect to our primary and secondary school system, this is absurd. Here and there you may find someone who can take a page of figures and maul them over so that they will come out all right at the bottom. But who wants to be a man like that? What fun does he get out of life, always sure of what the result is going to be? As for me, give me the regular method of addition by logic. That is, if the result obtained is 12 removed from the result that should have been obtained, then, ergo, 12 is the amount by which you have miscalculated, and it should, therefore, be added or subtracted, as the case may be, to or from the actual result somewhere up in the middle of the column, so that in the end the thing will balance. And there you are with just the same result as if you had worked for hours over the page and quibbled over every little point and figure. There is no sense in becoming a slave to numerical signs which in themselves are not worth the paper they are written on. It is the imagination that one puts into accounting that makes it fascinating. If free verse, why not free arithmetic? It is for the honest ones who admit that they can't work one of the budget systems for the mentally alert that the accompanying one has been devised. Let us take, for instance, a family whose income is $750,000 a year, exclusive of tips. In the family are a father, mother, and fox terrier. The expenses for such a family come under the head of liabilities, and are distributed among six accounts, food, lodging, extras, extras, incidentals, and extras. For this couple, I would advise the following system. Take the contents of the weekly pay envelope, $14,423.08. If anyone is mean enough to go and divide $750,000 into 52 parts to see if I have got it right, you will find that it doesn't quite come to eight cents, but you certainly wouldn't have me carry it out to any more places. It took me from three yesterday afternoon until dinner to do what I did. 
Take the contents of the envelope and lay them on the kitchen table in little piles. So much for meat, so much for eggs, so much for adhesive plaster, etc., until the kitchen table is covered. Then sweep it all into a bag and balance your books. Balancing the books is another point in the ideal system, which often makes for trouble. Sticklers for form insist that the two sides of the page shall come out alike, even at the expense of your self-respect. It is the artificiality of this that hurts. No matter how much you spend, no matter how much you receive, at the bottom of the page they must add up to the same thing with a double red line underneath them to show that the poles are closed. But since this is the accepted way of doing the thing, we might just as well concede the point and lay our plans accordingly. First, take the sum that you have left over in the household exchequer at the end of the month. Put it, or its equivalent in check form, on the table in front of you. Then, working backward, find out how much you have spent since the first of the month. This sum is the crux of the whole system. Divide it into as many equal parts as you have accounts. For instance, food, rent, clothes, insurance, and savings, operating expenses, higher life. If you can't divide it so that it comes out even, tuck a little bit on the higher life account. And, as the student of French says, voila, there it is. Perhaps you have wondered what I meant by higher life. I have. It might be well to state it here so that we can all get it clear in our minds. Under the higher life account, you can charge everything that you want to do, but feel that you can't afford. If you want to take in an inconsequential theatrical performance and can't quite square it with your conscience, figure it out this way. By going to that show, you will become so disgusted with the futility of such things that you will come out of the theater all aglow with a resolve to do a man's work in the world just as soon as you have caught up with your sleep. Surely that comes under advancement or higher life. Insurance budget helps always include under advancement money spent for lectures. Now it may be that I have drifted away from the big things in life since I moved out into the country, but somehow I can't just at this moment recollect standing in line at a box office for a lecture, but then my home life is very pleasant. Lectures would be a very convenient heading, nevertheless, to have in your budget. Then, any little items that slip your attention during the month, you can group under lectures and mark off ten paces in your advancement chart. By way of outlining beforehand just what you can spend on this and that, and it is usually on that, it might be well to take another family with a representative income. Let us say that there are four in the family and that the income is about $1,000 a year too small. If such a family would sit down some evening and draw a chart showing father's earning capacity with one red line and the family spending capacity with one black line, they would not only have a pleasant evening, but they would have a nice neat chart all drawn and suitable for framing. There is one little technical point that the amateur accountant will do well to remember. It gives a distinction to the page and shows that you are acquainted with bookkeeping lore. It is this. Label your debt column credits and your credit column debits. You might think that what you receive into the exchequer would be credited and your expenses debited, but that is where you miss the whole point of practical accounting. That would be too simple to be efficient. You must wax transcendental and say, I, as an individuated entity, am nothing. Everything is all. All is everything. There is a transcendent account to which all other accounts are responsible, and hence money turned over to the cinnamon account is not credited to that account, but rather debited to it for cinnamon hereby assumes the responsibility for the sum. As money is spent for cinnamon, its account is credited, for it is relieved of that responsibility. Don't start wondering where the responsibility finally settles, 
or you will throw something out of its stride in your brain. Some people profess to scoff at the introduction of bookkeeping into the running of the household. It is simply because they never tasted the fascination of the thing. The advantage of keeping family accounts is clear. If you do not keep them, you are uneasily aware of the fact that you are spending more than you are earning. If you do keep them, you know it. End of chapter 10 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina